Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you, Ms. Casewit. Um, and thank you to the organizers, and thank you for, uh, to all of you for having me here this afternoon. Uh, Ms. Xie um, mentioned at the beginning that uh, a number of hoped for presenters uh, weren't able to come at the last minute, and I am precisely one of those last minute substitutions. You're stuck with me, I'm sorry. Um, it's a bit odd that I'm here. Uh, I've never been a direct student of Dr. Nasser's. Um, I've always been at other institutions. Um, as uh, Ms. Casewood said, I am a humble historian of religions. I don't uh, publish as a, a proponent, as an advocate of perennialism. I don't uh, speak as an advocate. Uh, but I am one who has benefited tremendously from the work of people like Professor Nasser um, and, uh, and uh, like-minded scholars. Um, I guess a bit of anecdote, anecdotal introduction seems to be the way that these presentations are going, so I'll maybe trace a little bit of my journey here. Um, when I was in college, I, uh, my first year, I somehow got pulled away from what every good South Asian boy is supposed to do, engineering, and wanted to do comparative religion. Um, uh, thought about doing, I was raised uh, nominally Hindu, uh, raised very secularly, and my parents didn't teach me a thing. Um, but I just thought, uh, I've got to study something. I somehow caught the religion bug. I'll study Hinduism, why not? Eventually, I read my first book on Islam, my first book on Sufism, and I say, whoa, this sounds like the same thing to me. Right? I thought Islam was this totally different thing. It looks totally different. Sufism looks familiar to me. How do we explain that? I want to do some comparative religion. Uh, then I come start to take my first class in comparative religion and discover this, the, the, the postmodern turn, you could call it. Right? This era of, of modernist scholarship, which is, of course, the handmaiden of imperialism, of colonialism. Right? There is this uh, vibrant life for comparative religion, but it's coming with very scary, very destructive presuppositions. Right? Modernist, imperialist era scholars are coming in to the study of Islam, the study of Hinduism, the study of whatever, with a pronounced hubris, right? a sense that our religion, our way of life is clearly, obviously the most rational, the most sophisticated. Right? Everybody else is just some kind of savage, some kind of barbarian, maybe on the way to us someday. Right? If those are your starting presuppositions of comparison, right? there's going to be some disruption along the way. And that's exactly how the history of colonialism played out. So then comes the postmodern turn, which to my ears initially sounded really attractive. Right? Postmodernism, it's impossible to summarize it. It has so many different facets, so many different schools, so many different uh, features. But if something unites all of them, it is this passion for some kind of justice, some kind of social justice. Let the oppressed voice speak. Sounds good to me, right? Let the brown man speak for once, right? Let the black man speak for once. Let the Native American speak for once. Somehow, it just doesn't seem to play out that way. And I remember the moment uh, when I was taking that first comparative religion class. We read uh, uh, a, f a thinker, a, a, a religious studies scholar by the name of Jay-Z Smith, who famously uh, compared uh, comparative religion to magic, right? Comparative religion only exists in the scholar's study. In other words, when we compare two religions, two traditions, we invent comparisons in our head. But with the postmodern turn, we have to be deeply aware, right? We come with our own presuppositions, our own historical context, our own formations. We can't claim to make any kind of meta statement, any kind of objective statement about the way things are. We can't do that anymore. So all we can do, it seemed to me, was have nice ideas in our heads. Oh, that looks like that. Right? That looks similar to that. And we're not allowed to go any further. We're not allowed to make any further claim. Right? Any kind of statement about the objective nature of things is no longer something we can do. Right? That's where I was at least left in my early forays into postmodernism. At that particular moment, picking up, happening upon a book uh, by Dr. Nasser was a profound breath of fresh air. Right? Here's somebody who's trying to articulate a way forward uh, to do comparative religion in a way that does give voice right, to traditions that don't, have not had a voice for a very, very long time, and in most respects still don't. But hopefully we're getting there. Right? And hopefully a conference like this could be a, step, a further step in that direction. 
But as I said, I am a humble historian by training. Uh, I am an amateur wannabe philosopher in private. So I've been asked to speak about, this is the, the topic I was given, Islamic and comparative philosophy, Islamic philosophy and comparative philosophy. Uh, I'm gonna hide behind history most of the time. That's what I do best. Um, I'll start with a brief overview, uh, uh, unforgivably brief overview. Uh, I, I feel your pain, Dr. Falfuri. 1,400 years of, of, of the history of Islamic philosophy, specifically in respect uh, of how this tradition articulated something that we might call comparative philosophy. Right? The Islamic tradition encountering other forms of philosophy, other forms of religious thought, and finding some way to make sense of it intellectually. After giving that brief overview, uh, that brief outline, I'm going to turn to, I'm going to stick with my specialty, uh, South Asia, and uh, spend a bit of time with one particular text, uh, which happens to be a, uh, it's authored by an Indian Muslim named Nizamuddin Panipati in the uh, early uh, 17th century, late 16th century. Uh, it's actually a translation. It's a translation of a Hindu text called the Yoga Vasishta, so wonderfully illustrated here. Uh, in, in manuscript form. Um, I'm going to uh, just look at a brief section of the, the introduction of this translation, and we can see how this particular Muslim scholar, Nizamuddin Panipati, draws on the tradition of Islamic philosophy to try to encounter, wrestle with, make sense of Hindu thought. And I'm actually going to focus on the way Nizamuddin Panipati wrestles with one particular Hindu term, that Muslim thinkers had long found particularly troublesome, namely the term deva, right? Deity, or god, or goddess. Um, so that is the plan. Uh, and then hopefully there'll be some time at the end. Uh, I'll just suggest a few, I'll put on my philosopher's cap for just a moment, suggest a few directions uh, where we could potentially uh, learn from, right? Here we have a Muslim thinker, Nizamuddin Panipati, who is actively trying to do a kind of comparative philosophy. I hope maybe in the Q&A or the discussion afterwards, we could consider directions that we might take um, some hints from Panipati for doing comparative philosophy today. The world has arguably never needed it more than it does right now. Um, so let's begin with the general overview. Uh, two central features of the Islamic philosophical tradition that I would highlight at the forefront uh, insofar as comparative philosophy is concerned um, is a feature of the tradition that's actually quite in line with the Quran itself. Uh, these features are on the one hand that the knowledge encapsulated by the Islamic philosophical tradition is one that has been conveyed through prophets. Right? That's the first point. The second, is that Islamic philosophy isn't actually saying anything really new. It's not saying anything particularly new. I'm guessing that Professor Dogler will um, dwell on this more at length when he's talking about the Quran, but just for our purposes here, uh, I'll say that the Quran is quite insistent and unambiguous in affirming that it, the Islamic revelation sent through the Prophet Muhammad, is merely a reminder and a confirmation of the same essential truths that were conveyed by God to the long lineage of prophets that preceded Muhammad. In other words, in a very fundamental way, according to the Quran, the revelation sent to Muhammad and all the previous revelations sent to Moses, Jesus, Abraham, David, etc., all teach the same fundamental truth or truths. Expressing a rather similar sentiment from the very beginnings of the Islamic philosophical tradition, uh, dating to the 9th century or earlier, depending upon how you define philosophy, uh, Islamic philosophers have consistently emphasized that the knowledge they wrote about in scholastic treatises is the very same knowledge that was brought by God's chosen prophets. Starting with Al-Kindi in the 9th century of the Common Era and continuing on through the centuries, Islamic philosophers would regularly assert that the content of their philosophical knowledge was the same as the content of God's revelations. Uh, in other words, Islamic philosophy and the entire history of divine books, the Torah, the Gospels, the Bible, the Quran, etc., teach the same truths just in different languages. Philosophy employs a more rational and systematic mode of discourse, while the prophets utilized a more poetic, imaginative, and affective language. 
Um, so already we can see that the uh, revelation versus reason debate is pitched quite differently in this context, right? In, in the modern West, it is a, a, an antagonistic relationship, right? Reason seems to conflict with revelation. Here, quite in contrast, we see the majority of view in the Islamic philosophical tradition is that the truths known by reason and the truths known by revelation are one and the same. There's no contradiction between them except with regard to the mode of expression. The philosophers and the prophets know the same truths, though the prophets also know considerably more. So the idea would just be, if I could attempt an illustration, uh, the Quran might paint a breathtaking picture of an all-powerful God who creates all things from the millions of gleaming stars in the sky down to the last merciful drop of life-producing rain. This is the exact same knowledge conveyed by, say, Ibn Sina's rational proof for why there must be a God and his second proof for why this God must be omnipotent. I warned you, dry and rational. But it's the same truth. It's the same truth. We don't have time to go into Avicenna's proof for this. Unfortunately, we have to move on. Uh, the clear implication of this assertion is that the knowledge expressed by Islamic philosophy is as old as philosophy itself. Right? This isn't a new knowledge that was innovated by certain Muslim thinkers, such as Farabi or Ibn Sina, uh, the 10th and 11th centuries, respectively. But rather, this is simply a re-articulation in a different or perhaps more refined language of primordial truths that had been taught by the many ancient philosophers of previous generations. Um, naturally, with the earliest generations, right, again, Al-Kindi, Farabi, Avicenna, the natural pull was toward the ancient Greek philosophical tradition. Right? Those were the ancients that they primarily re referred themselves to. Starting around 750, under the Abbasid Caliphate, the grand corpus of ancient Greek philosophical and scientific texts had been translated into Arabic, including various writings of Plato, Aristotle, important Neoplatonists, such as Plotinus and Proclus, and some material from the pre-Socratics as well. So now with suddenly this vast corpus of Greek knowledge to draw on, naturally the early uh, thinkers in the Islamic philosophical tradition made Greece their foundational reference point. Right? These ancient Greek philosophers taught the same truths that we Muslim philosophers are writing about centuries later. Um, these early Islamic philosophers would quickly go even a step further and link their philosophical practice not only with the Greek heritage, but more explicitly with the idea or the notion of prophecy. As we see in such early treatises, uh, uh, such philosophical works as the Rasa'il, the treatises of the Ikhwan al Safa, the Quranic prophet Idris, right, one of the prophets named in the Quran, Idris, is identified with the Greek figure Hermes. Hermes, this Greek god, uh, is now cast as an ancient prophet who first brought the divine science of philosophy from heaven down to humankind, thus initiating the practice of philosophy for all later generations. Later, Islamic philosophy regularly repeats this identification of Idris with Hermes, um, thus in further entrenching this uh, kinship, this closeness, um, this harmony between prophecy, the divine cycle of prophets, and the practice of Islamic philosophy. Uh, Dr. Nasser, in his opening comments, uh, already cited some of the more explicit philosophical articulations of this idea taken to its most universal or most global valence. Uh, Ibn Miskawe, I only know the Arabic pronunciation. I don't even. I can't even do the, the other one. Uh, Ibn Miskawe, uh, working in the 10th and 11th centuries, uh, composed a treatise called the Javidan Khirad, uh, a Persian term which is uh, glossed in Arabic as al-Hikmah al-Khalida, right? The perennial wisdom, or you could say the perennial philosophy. Uh, Suhrawardi, Shahabuddin Suhrawardi, working in the 12th century, as uh, Professor Nasser already mentioned, uh, he was the first to perhaps render this nascent concept of a perennial wisdom, a global sort of wisdom, uh, in its most explicitly universal and global form. I'll give a few more details that Dr. Nasser didn't mention. Uh, according to Suhrawardi, philosophy 
uh, was a wisdom that was built into the very first human being. And so now philosophy is as old as humanity itself, right? the very first human being. Uh, in Suhrawardi's sort of characteristic terminology, this ancient and, uh, I was going to say eternal, but I should call it perennial, this ancient and perennial philosophical wisdom is a primordial light that was passed down by means of a fertile leaven, right? a kind of yeast-based bread, um, through a noble lineage of illuminated sages. Right? And Suhrawardi gives us quite a fascinating list. Uh, this uh, lineage of illuminated sages includes Hermes, Empedocles, Pythagoras, Plato, the Neoplatonists, also the ancient Egyptians, Babylonians, Zoroastrians, Hindus, Buddhists, and throw in some more recent Sufi figures such as Dhul Nun al-Masri, Abu Yazid al-Bistami, Sahel al-Tustari, al-Halaj, and many others. Suhrawardi further attests, I'm paraphrasing a few lines from uh, his magnum opus here, uh, he attests in his writings that the world has never been without philosophy. And he tags on to this the notion that the difference between earlier and later philosophers is only with respect to their language, as well as with respect to their divergent habits. Here the idea is that some philosophers preferred to state their doctrines more explicitly, while others preferred to only hint at them. Right? This is part of the beginnings of the way that Suhrawardi tries to account for the different ways, the different ideas that uh, all philosophers, ancient until contemporary, express their ideas. But it's all, again, this same universal wisdom, this universal philosophy. Later philosophical and Sufi texts, uh, Mahmoud Shabistri's Gulshan Iraz comes quickly to mind, would readily echo such sentiments. Uh, the trend is further development, developed by such later Islamic philosophers as Mullah Sadra, who passed away in 1640, for whom this idea of an eternal wisdom was quite significant. Um, right. So this intellectual framework uh, was firmly in place, right? The idea that philosophical wisdom is a feature fully present in a multitude of human civilizations and that its content is singular while its expressions in different languages are multiple, right? Islamic philosophers have this basic framework already entrenched in their tradition, which allows them to build off of this framework and forge a broad variety of comparative philosophical endeavors that I can't begin to summarize here. Right? Remember how vast the Islamic world is. Southern Spain, Eastern Europe, North Africa, most of Sub-Saharan Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, India, China, Indonesia, Southeast Asia, right? The Islamic philosophical tradition encountered all of these other religious worlds, other religious universes. Right? And wherever Islamic civilization went, Islamic philosophy would find some way to make sense of the different varieties of philosophical and religious thought that they found uh, in these places. Uh, I shouldn't paint uh, too biased a picture. Uh, there are plenty of polemics here going on. Right? This isn't some kind of kumbaya, uh, everybody teaches the same thing sort of thing. But uh, this is a rational tradition. There is such a thing as truth and error. Right? So this framework um, becomes a launching off point for any of a wide variety of uh, philosophical polemics, most certainly. There's no shortage of Islamic philosophical works uh, that would refute uh, the Christian notion of the Trinity, for example, or the notion that, uh, of Christ being the Son of God. Right? Abundant polemics uh, of this variety. But what is uh, truly amazing is that these different religious and philosophical civilizations were able to share a common language, right? By and large, these figures are not talking past each other, right? This isn't a Christian just being dogmatic about what he believes and a Muslim being dogmatic about what he believes. No, they had a shared philosophical language and they actually could argue with each other, right? Jewish philosophers as well. So this is really uh, quite uh, an amazing development if you think about it, and one that would have been very difficult without this presumption that there can, in fact, be philosophical truths in other religions, in other, in other languages, in other civilizations. Sometimes we will even find certain Muslim philosophers who will affirm that their Jewish or Christian philosophical interlocutors actually have it more right than most of their fellow Muslims. 
Right? Again, this kind of framework of a kind of universal wisdom makes this kind of affirmation possible, right? which is quite remarkable. Um, this is the stuff that tends to get talked about more. Uh, I tend to work in context South Asia, for example, that, that uh, aren't as often talked about. Um, so in super brief, uh, I could only allude to the fascinating developments we find when the Islamic philo philosophical tradition reaches China. Uh, Muslim philosophers in China readily plug Islamic philosophy into the language of the Neo-Confucian scholarly tradition that had dominated the region at that time. So now Muhammad, in this Chinese context, is referred to not as a prophet, but rather by the Neo-Confucian terminology of being a sage or a righteous ruler. So now the sage Muhammad, what does he teach? He teaches, naturally, the Tao. Right? You've heard of the Tao Te Ching, right? the, which means way. Muhammad teaches the Tao of Muhammad, as contrasted with the Tao of Confucius. But Muhammad's teaching, these Chinese Muslim philosophers quickly add, are only a completion and a continuation of the Tao of Confucius. Right? There's no need to talk about abrogation here. It's not that the Tao of Muhammad has now uh, superseded and nullified the Tao of Confucius. No, the Tao of Muhammad is simply the completion, the prolongation and completion of the Tao of Confucius. So Muhammad is placed squarely in the lineage of Neo-Confucian sages, who all represent a singular philosophical wisdom, again, in multiple complementary languages. Similarly, amazing things going on in Sub-Saharan Africa. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into such detail today, because uh, I have to finish, ooh, pretty soon. OK, so now to the second portion of my talk and my own specialization, the context of Muslim South Asia. As I mentioned, I want to introduce you uh, so a little bit more history to introduce you to the context in which this text that I'm going to talk about was written. The text is known as the Jug Basisht, which again is a translation of the Hindu philosophical treatise, the Yoga Vasishta. Uh, here, even at the level of art, you can see the kind of um, meeting of cultures that's going on, right? We have uh, Rama and Lakshmana, right, two Hindu, uh, heroes of the Hindu uh, literary tradition being drawn here. You have yogis, wandering sadhus, being drawn uh, alongside um, Sufis, right? Wandering Sufis and Sufi aesthetics. Uh, just a picture of the manuscript because I'm a geek like that. Um, and then this is the text itself that we're going to talk about today. Can you guys read this? Is it all right? There's going to be one slide here. I'm sorry. I did not anticipate the size of the room. It's going to be unreadable. Um, but we'll, we'll deal with that when we come to it. OK, so just a bit more historical background first. During the height of the Mughal Empire in early modern South Asia, 16th to 17th centuries of the Common Era, Muslim nobles patronized and facilitated the translation of several Hindu Sanskrit texts into the Persian language. Texts like the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, especially the Bhagavad Gita, the Atharva Veda, the Upanishads, the Bhagavata Purana, and several others. Typically, these translations were accomplished by teams of uh, Persian-speaking Muslim scholars on the one hand and Hindu Sanskrit pundits on the other, right? working together to accomplish a translation from Sanskrit into most typically Persian. Um, most modern scholarly efforts to analyze these translations in depth uh, have only just begun uh, in the past few decades. Uh, close analyses of particular translations remain very much a desideratum, alongside the search for effective frameworks for making sense of the linguistic, intellectual, and political processes that drove these Mughal translation efforts. Um, so, as I said, I'm just going to focus on how, in this particular text, our Muslim translator, Nizamuddin Panipati, tried to make sense of this particularly troublesome Hindu notion of the deva, the deity. Stated briefly, given the Islamic tradition's characteristic emphasis upon the notion of tawhid, monotheism, or affirming God's oneness, the vast multiplicity of the Hindu devas, and the seeming polytheism that such a vision might suggest rubbed up against Muslim sensibilities for centuries. Right? Vishnu, Shiva, Ganesha, Saraswati, right? There should be one God. Right? How can we make sense of this seeming polytheism? 
Furthermore, the closely related notion, right? There's the deva, the deity. There's this accompanying notion of the avatara, right? The divine descent, right? The Hindu idea that uh, the, the deva, say Vishnu, can be born in a concrete embodied form on earth. This, of course, rubbed up against the classical Islamic notion that prophets are not at all divine, but are merely human beings like other human beings. Um, so Muslim translators naturally struggled with this term. Here's the textual history that I'm going to be dealing with. The original Sanskrit text is known as the Yoga Vasishta, composed by a Kashmiri pundit by the name of Gauda Abhinanda. Uh, just so you know, in the Sanskrit world, if you can get it within 400 years, that's considered really accurate. Um, one, a number of commentaries are written on this text. I'm only going to be dealing with one, a Sanskrit commentary by a Hindu philosopher named Atma Sukha. Uh, his commentary is called the Vasishta Chandrika. And then finally, we have a complete Persian translation, the Jug Basisht, which was written by Nizamuddin Panipati with the assistance of Jagannatha Mishra Banarasi and Patan Mishra Jajipuri. Here, of course, we get an exact date. Muslims were way better with dates than the Hindus were. 1597. Uh, so the struggles of Muslim thinkers to make sense of the Sanskrit notion of deva or deity goes back more than a millennium. Uh, I'll just rush through a few examples in the interests of time. Uh, Abu Rehan al-Biruni, the famous scholar who, uh, really a jack of all trades, renowned for so many uh, different disciplines, uh, he wrote his book on India, um, where he was trying to make sense of the differences between Hin uh, Indian civilization's vast array of divine, celestial, supernatural creatures. Devas, Asuras, Rakshasas, Daityas, Dhanavas, Gandharvas, Apsaras, Bhutas, Nagas, Yakshas, etc., etc. And then, of course, the pantheon of Devas themselves, Brahma, Prajapati, Narayana, Vishnu, Shiva, Rudra. Right? Biruni wanted to account for each of these. He ultimately settled on calling Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the main deities, Malaika. They're angels. Right? That's what we should call them. Uh, perhaps just as famously, the Mughal scholar Prince Dada Shukul passed away in 1659. Uh, he, uh, in his famous treatise, the Majma al-Bahrain, the meeting place of the two oceans, similarly identifies Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, right, the three of the main Hindu deities, with the Islamic archangels, Jibrail, Gabriel, Mikhail, Michael, and Israfil. Uh, meanwhile, the three devas, right, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, they all have female consorts. They have wives, right? Uh, Saraswati, Lakshmi, and Parvati. Darashako identified these with the Islamic idea of the divine attributes, the Sifat Allah. One modern scholar, Carl Ernst, comments upon the, quote, highly selective, eclectic, Islamizing touches inherent in the translation choices of figures like Biruni and Darashuko. Noting that rendering the term deva by the Islamic term malaika, quote, surely amounts to a theological shift, such that we could only loosely call this a translation in the broadest sense of the term. Another scholar, Roderick Vasi, um, I'll skip the particular example, but his evaluation of the translation is that it's, quote, more an interpretation of the Sanskrit than a translation, right? The Muslim translator, uh, here the translator is trying to translate the term Krishna, all the specificity of Krishna, right? His blue skin color, his lovemaking, his adultery for sure, all of that is whitewashed, right? And you get this chaste Allah or Khuda that's replaced, right? So again, not a translation according to these modern scholars, but just a kind of Islamic interpretation or an Islamic domestication of Hindu thought. One could readily cite numerous other modern academic voices who, in brief, only see here in this whole translation movement a case of bad translations, or perhaps we could say bad comparative philosophy. Right? Rather than, than taking Hindu thought in its own terms, these Muslim philosophers are simply domesticating it within their own religious and philosophical worldview, or so the critique goes. It would be something like a Muslim thinker trying to have a conversation with a Muslim philosopher um, who simply kept referring to Allah as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, completely deaf to this Muslim, his Muslim interlocutor's deep discomfort with the idea of the Trinity. Right? 
That seems to be the scholarly consensus of what's going on in these translations. All of these evaluations, of course, partake to a greater or lesser extent in the post-linguistic turn tendency that has been prominent in Euro-American academia for many decades, uh, but which carries numerous assumptions that medieval and early modern Muslim translators largely did not share. To state the issue in simpler terms, I basically want to ask, I want to think more deeply about why, other than perhaps Ananda Kumaraswamy, no modern scholar seems to think that angel or divine attribute are particularly good translations for the Sanskrit term deva, while centuries of Muslim translators seem to think that these were perfectly fine and effective translations. Why the discrepancy? How do we account for that? Um, so to pursue this question again, I'm going to spend the rest of my time. How much time do I have? We'll see how it goes. Uh, sorry, how much? Is there going to be a Q&A after? Or? Um, we're going to have a break, and then, uh, and then there'll be a Q&A. Oh, ah, I can do this then. All right, perfect. Thanks. Um, so precisely, let's take a look at how Nizam Adin Panipati, again, the Muslim scholar translator, navigates this translational quandary. How does he wrestle with the term deva? And let's try to reconstruct the logic behind his translation choices as well as possible. Um, so just a brief introduction to this text. Uh, well, I can skip over some of that. Panipati, in order to make this translation work, had to bend and stretch the Persian language in such a way that it had to accept an influx of a tremendous volume of new vocabulary whose roots lay in Sanskrit, right? A language, a conceptual universe that was completely foreign to the Islamic world. Nearly every page of the Jugbasisht contains numerous Sanskrit terms transliterated into Persian that are relevant to an extremely broad range of Hindu philosophical topics. And for those of you who know Hinduism at all, terms like puja, shastra, tirtha, tapasya, dhyana, varna, maya, mahapralaya. Uh, and many, many, many others appear in transliteration throughout the treatise, peppering nearly every page of the manuscripts. The, the three translators naturally have to try to make all of these foreign words comprehensible for a Persian reader, so they often insert multiple word definitions or single word definitions, glosses, illustrations, analogies, metaphors, and they're often drawing this, uh, these explanatory tools from the Quran, from the tradition of Persian Sufi poetry, or from the tradition of Islamic philosophy. Or else they might take them from the Hindu intellectual tradition itself. Even in the very first lines of the Jugbasisht, we routinely find correlations and homologies being established. For example, between a Sanskrit term like Brahman, right, a standard Hindu term for ultimate reality, is readily correlated with Islamic terms like Allah, or wujud e mutlaq, right, a philosophical term for absolute being. Um, all right, so let's look at some text itself. Uh, in the first pages of the Jugbasisht, Panipati and our two Sanskrit pundits set out to translate the opening lines of the Yogavasishta, composed by Gauda Abhinanda. Oops. All right. Here's what Panipati writes. The Kashmiri Pandit Abhinanda, who is the author of the text of the Yoga Vasishta, the Jug Vasisht, uh, at the commencement of this abridgment, leads off with the name of God and praises for the Creator Most High. Now, you see the first lines of the Yoga Vasishta right there. He's not saying most of that, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe salutations to that manifest self of Abhasa Atman, the Lord Vibhu, who is both within and beyond the heavens, the earth and the sky, who shines forth in me and in each self. Maybe our modern scholars have a point. Maybe this isn't a very good translation, right? Um, what is actually happening, this took me a while to figure out, is that the translators are actually taking the words, the opening lines of the commentary, Atmasukha's commentary. They're loosely translating that and putting Atmasukha's words in Abhinanda's mouth, right? So it's actually Atmasukha here who seems to be leading off with the name of God and praises for the Creator Most High. 
Right? Atmasukha uh, starts his commentary with uh, several lines of praise in, uh, in praise of various devas, um, uh, which our three uh, translators very loosely render into Persian, and then again put in Abhinanda's own mouth, as though Abhinanda wrote these words when it was actually Atmasukha. Uh, unsurprisingly, since the Persian text is speaking about various names and deities and divinities that might be foreign to most of its Muslim readers, the translators interpolate a great deal of their own descriptions of these deities so as to help their readers out a bit. The translators then opened the treatise as follows. The Brahmins of India possess the religious path, the madhab, the mazhab, of the ancient sages, hukamaya mutakaddimin, uh, here a reference to uh, Greek philosophies, the Greek philosophers, the ancient philosophers, uh, as, I just, as I mentioned before, the way Ibn Sina, Farabi talk about the ancient sages, right? Uh, the Brahmins of India possess the religious path of the ancient sages concerning the oneness of the essence of the real, may he be praised and exalted, and concerning the attributes of his perfection, the levels of his descents into the world, the origin of multiplicity, and the manifestation of the worlds. If any distinction should obtain, presumably between the Brahmins and the ancient sages, it would only be with respect to terminology and language, estelah and zaban. So here again, that same sentiment that we saw earlier that pervades the Islamic philosophical tradition. Only a difference of language and technical usage, but it is the same truth. Um, lots of things worthy of comment in this passage, but in the interests of time, I will just direct our attention to the clear and abundant use of the technical vocabulary of the tradition of philosophical Sufism known as Wahdat al-Wujud. Right. Typically attributed to the 13th century Andalusian Sufi thinker Ibn al-Arabi, right, the so-called school of the oneness of being or the unity of being. Uh, I'll call this the Wujudi tradition for the rest of this talk. Uh, the translators make direct reference to the Wujudi tradition's characteristic doctrine of manifestation or divine self-disclosure wherein God, the absolutely real, is described as manifesting itself in the form of the world through or by means of its divine names and attributes. More on this idea in a moment. The passage continues. I hope you can still read it. It's going to get worse. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> the Kashmiri Pandit Abhinanda, who is the author of the text of the Yoga Vasishta, at the commencement of this abridgment, leads off the names of God and praises the Creator Most High. Sorry, we already read that part. It should be known that the names of the real, Nam Haya Haq, have no end or limit. Every one of the great rishis, a Sanskrit term for sages, and the seekers of the real has chosen one of his names, one of God's names, which are in accordance with the avatars and are the manifestations, tajaliyat, of the levels of his self-disclosure. Those rishis and seekers remember their chosen name much. They seek by means of that name a generous emanation, faiz, or faith in Arabic, from him who is the origin of all emanation. The modes of the avatara are laid out in the revered books of the people of India. So Panipati here references, or glosses, uh, the notion of the Quranic names and attributes of God, al-asma was sifat basing themselves upon a well-known hadith in which the Prophet speaks of God's 99 names, Sufi philosophers have often looked to the names and adjectives by which God describes himself in the Quran as a window into articulating God's nature. While some exegetes have strived to restrict any valid description of God to the specific names and attributes by which he describes himself in the Quran, other interpreters of the Quran, Ibn Arabi included among them, have insisted that the number of divine names is in fact infinite, since the aspects and dimensions of God's nature can never be exhaustively enumerated. This latter interpretation, which Panipati evidently favors in this passage, since he describes the names as, quote, having no end or limit, creates space for other valid ways of characterizing God in other scriptures and in other languages. In this case, Panipati is suggesting that the Hindu deities and avatars, including Ganesha, Saraswati, Shiva, etc., are also among the names of God. So Panipati here 
uh, bypasses the equation of the devas with the Islamic angels, uh, as we saw with Biruni and Darashiko, and instead prefers to characterize the devas in terms of the Islamic notion of God's names and attributes. Uh, Islamic philosophers in the Wujudi tradition have tended to view the divine names as articulating the grand modes through which the human individual might relate to God, might have a relationship with God. God himself in his essence, in his that, zat in Persian, is utterly transcendent and unknowable, and hence beyond any form of relationship with any quote unquote other. According to Sufi philosophers, however, God chose to manifest or disclose himself, this technical term, tajaliyat. Uh, God discloses himself to creation, voluntarily assuming various names and attributes as his grand modes of relating to human beings and to the world. Accordingly, God is the Quranic name, the merciful, al-Rahman, insofar as he turns a merciful face toward creation. He is the Islamic name, the just, al-Adl, insofar as he discloses his justice to the world, and so forth and so on. Uh, accordingly, at any given moment, a human individual, whether consciously or not, will always experience a relationship with God through some combination of these names. In his introductory comments here, Panipati is including the Hindu deities and avatars under this Quranic framework. A devotee who approaches Vishnu thus is simply relating to that particular, now Sanskritic, divine name, which is merely one aspect, dimension, or face of the absolute transcendent real, albeit a quite central one. The passage continues though. A devotee of a particular deity uh, experiences a unique attraction or a special affinity for that particular face of the divine which Panipati translates into the Quranic and Sufi terminology of, quote, choosing one of his names and, quote, remembering that name much. Here, Panipati echoes the dozens of exhortations in the Quran to remember God often, chapter 26, verse 227, to mention the name of one's Lord, chapter 87, verse 15, and numerous other verses, right? Uh, a plethora of them. The operative word here being the Sufi notion, the Islamic spiritual notion of dhikr, remembering or mentioning God's names. Hence, despite the countless formal differences that exist between the varieties of Islamic remembrance and piety versus the varieties of Hindu worship and contemplation, Panipati is nevertheless willing to assert that both of these fall under the general Islamic concept of mentioning or invoking God's names. Later on in the treatise, in fact, the translators will ultimately correlate this idea with the Hindu practice of japa, right? which is precisely the repetition of divine names and mantras. In the next passage, the three... Tra oh, this is the one. Yeah, probably can't read that, right? <laughs> uh, we're going to skip the top part because uh, we don't have time. Um, but it's worth just pointing out that uh, what the translators have done here actually is uh, laid out a quite faithful account of the Hindu doctrine of the four yugas, the four cycles of time, which repeat thousands and thousands of times for all uh, eternity. Um, this is a notion that would be very strange, very foreign to most typical you know, classical Muslim thinkers. The idea of rebirth, the idea of a universe that's destroyed and then reborn, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but here, in all of its Hindu particularity, it's allowed to shine, right? The translators don't insert very little. They insert the, uh, the day of resurrection, Qiyamat, in passing at one point. Otherwise, it's quite a faithful account. So this would be a passage that pushes back against modern scholars who would accuse these Muslim translators of just domesticating the text, right? Even though this would make so many Muslim thinkers uncomfortable, here it is allowed to stand in the translation. Uh, but here I'll refer to the bottom paragraph, if you can read it, um, where the, the, the translators introduce the readers to the notion of the avatara, or the divine descent in corporeal form in the world. The people of India say that in these four yugas that were just described, the absolute being and light of the unseen for the sake of improving the condition of the people of the world, out of his own will and generosity, manifests himself in the world through a special manifestation. One of these special manifestations is Narasimha, 
who is in the half man, half lion form. The passage goes on to name numerous other deities and to describe those deities. So here again, uh, the translators are putting Atmasuka's words into Abhinanda's mouth. Right? This is that list of praises to the deity that begins Atmasuka's commentary. Uh, he starts with a praise of precisely Narasimha. This is Vishnu's avatar, Vishnu's divine descent in the form of a half man, half lion. Atmasuka proceeds to praise Brahma, the creator de deity, Shiva, Ganesha, Saraswati, Valmiki, and Rama in that order. The three translators follow suit, penning eulogies to each deity, which they again attribute to Abhinanda, while adding a few lines of explanation on the character and function of each deva. Thus, Ganesha, for example, removes obstacles. Um, Saraswati, meanwhile, grants knowledge and, like the waters of the Ganges, confers purification upon those who resort to her. Um, time. All right, I'll wrap this up pretty quickly. Uh, in the description of these various deities, we see a bit more concretely how exactly Panipati envisions the Islamic notion of the divine names and attributes fitting in with the Sanskritic notion of the deva. We've already noted Panipati's Vujudi metaphysics, wherein the entire created universe is understood as a manifestation of God's names and attributes. Now we see that Panipati understands each deva or avatara as a special manifestation or a special specification, ta'ayyun, of the un unmanifest and indescribable reality. Or else it's a specific name, a specific nam of the real, such that the Sanskrit names Shiva, Ganesha, Saraswati, and Rama can stand alongside the Islamic names Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, etc. Uh, again, according to Sufi uh, philosophers of the Wujudi tradition, every object in the universe, right, this podium, this chair, uh, is ultimately a manifestation of God. But some manifestations are far more central and hierarchically superior than others. Right? The mountains of the Shenandoah, not too far from here, surely manifest God's divine attribute of majesty, Jalal, far more directly and effectively than, say, a pebble um, out on the pavement, uh, outside on the street. The same is true all the more of the Sanskrit devas in relation to more ordinary names and manifestations of God. Again, podium, chair, something like that. Uh, this is why Panipati describes them precisely as special, specific, or even excellent or noble, right? All connotations built into the adjective khas. Uh, hmm. I have a few other notes here on how the translators are drawing from the Islamic philosophical tradition. Um, but I think I better skip over that in the interests of time. So maybe just some concluding reflections then. Uh, oh, just one last uh, bit of text here. Um, this comes just slightly later in the passage. Again, we see an echo of uh, this characteristic that pervades the Islamic philosophical tradition. Uh, here, the book, the Veda, God's speech from God's own mouth manifests the total and perfect manifestation. The Vedas are books of Sharia. Kutube Shariat, a total complete book of Sharia. Again, Islamic philosophy is inextricably tied to revelation. The Hindus, of course, have their own revelation. Right, the Yoga Vasishta, just like our own Islamic philosophy, is completely consonant with that, right, with the various manifestations in different languages. Um, so to very quickly come back then to modern scholarship, right, in casually asserting that these translations are inaccurate or that they're effectively bad, uh, one suspects that precious few of these modern academics have actually stopped to try to become aware of the presumptions that underlie such a value judgment. It just seems obvious to them that these are bad translations. But from within the context of another worldview, right, the sort of wujudi philosophical worldview of Panipati, these might in fact be excellent translations. Right? Um, so the first step in comparative philosophy is precisely to 
become aware of our own assumptions and axioms. Even if this is the battle cry of postmodernism, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, playing out in all the ways that it actually should. Another kind of, of uh, blind spot, uh, I mentioned the post-linguistic term, a phrase that might not be uh, known to all of you, um, but this idea that language is constructed in history, right? The idea is, again, that we're all products of our own context. We're all products of our own specific location, our time, our place. We shouldn't have any presumptions to universal knowledge or transcendent knowledge, right? Again, it's a nice gesture of humility, but look at how it flies in the face of the kind of philosophy of language that's being presumed here. Right? For modern scholars, the modern, modern voices I, I referenced, uh, a lifetime of invoking a Rahman, Ya Rahman, Ya Rahman, or Hey Shiva, Hey Shiva, Hey Shiva, would only more deeply entrench you in your specific context. Right? A lifetime of that would only make you all the more particularly Hindu, or all the more particularly Muslim, which is at the exact antipodes of what our thinkers are saying here. These are the words precisely that allow us to transcend particularity and return to the universal. Right? Again, this universal wisdom that pervades the Islamic philosophical tradition. A lot more that could be said. I hope you can take it up in the Q&A, but I think I've spent my time. Thank you. Thank you.